Hello, baseball fans. I'm Chris Durrell. I'm here at MotorPros.com to bring you episode three of my DFS MLB video series. In this episode, we're going to be talking the difference between cash games and GPPs and then jumping into contest selection on DraftKings and FanDuel just to show you what contests you should be entering uh, depending on which game style, cash game, or GPP that you are playing and how to best strategize and jump into the contests that are going to help you be most successful. Before we get started, if you're not a member yet of RotorPros.com, make sure to go over to the website in the top right-hand corner, click that Sign Up button, and right now we've got a three-day trial with a weekly membership, a seven-day trial with a monthly and yearly membership. We cover MLB, PGA, NASCAR, NFL when that comes back around again. NHL and NBA are both in playoffs right now. We are in our Slack channel. We've got tons of different channels set up here. We've got daily content. This is where we share all of our articles as well as our cheat sheets, our player pools, anything we've got set up for the games. We cover, like I said, all the different sports. We've got different channels for all that. We are here to help you, and we offer a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. Um, so when this video is over, definitely reach out to me in the Slack channel, and I can help you be more successful on a daily basis when playing daily fantasy baseball. With that, let's jump into episode number three. First of all, I'm going to be referring to my cheat sheet as I do a lot. It's kind of it's a piece of our main content. Um, that I reference stuff from on a daily basis. If you haven't yet, go back and check out the Baseball Cheat Sheet Overview video on our YouTube channel as well as Episodes 1 and 2, which covered pitching stats as well as uh, hitting stats as well. It's going to kind of explain what all of this means and how I use it to construct lineups on a daily basis. I will refer to it quite a bit in this video as well. So first of all, we're going to talk about cash games. There is three different kinds of cash games that we mainly talk about. We've got our double-ups. We've got our 50-50s and we've got our head-to-heads. So the difference between cash games and, and going with the GPP formats is half the field is usually paid out. So it's a little bit easier to cash. You don't need to have as big a you know, winning scores, no matter what sport you're playing, to be able to cash in these 50-50s. But whether you finish first or 50th in a contest, say, of 100 people, you're going to get paid the same. In a $5 contest, with 100 people in a 50-50, whether you finish first or 50th, you're going to get a $9 return. So just keep that in mind when you're playing your double ups, as you're not going to get the big payouts. But you're going. This is how we recommend you consistently build your bankroll. Um, in our chat, we tell our customers on a daily basis that we either like a 70-30, 80-20 kind of split, which means if you're entering $100 on any given night. We'd like 70 or $80 of that to go towards cash games, which are your double ups, your 50-50s, and your head-to-heads. And then the $30 to $20 to go towards your GPPs. Um, the reason for this is a little bit safer playing cash games is how you're going to consistently build your bankroll. And on most nights, um, if you're hitting out of if you're playing seven days and you're hitting five out of seven days in your double ups, that's paying for your GPP entries, that other 20%, so that when you do hit your GPPs, you're going to get a big payday. So it's just kind of the way we go about um, teaching our customers bankroll management in chat. Um, on, on some night, you know, it's going to differ on every day, every single slate. Some slates might just go really low but generally on your main slates we're looking at a 70 30 80 20 split between cash games and gpps so with those cash games we're just going to look at a few here on DraftKings. so i'm just going to go up here we're going to look at mlb and we're going to look at tonight there's only a two game slate but that doesn't really matter we're just breaking this down so then i'm just going to sort um we'll go anything under 50 dollars here and we'll look at 50 50s and double ups here on the left hand side menu so what we're looking at, the two different kinds, so we've got double ups. So when you look at this $5 double up, there's 344 people, but only 150 people get paid. So that's 43% of the field is getting double their money back. The difference between that and a 50-50 is if you scroll down and you find some 50-50s here and you look at that same $5 50-50 with 10 people, half the field gets paid. So five people out of those 10 are going to get paid but you're only getting $9, so you're paying that rake. So the only difference really between a 50-50 and a double up is how the sites go about getting their rake. So in this, you're only getting $9 when you win. Half the field's getting paid, so you're paying a dollar rake. Versus when you start looking at the double ups, you're getting double your money. So you're entering for five, you're getting 10 back, you're doubling your money, but only 150 people out of that 344 get paid. So either way, the sites are getting their rake. Um, you're making about double your money. I, double ups are definitely the most popular and when we're looking for contests, looking for cash games, looking to enter these, the best way to do it when you're first starting out 
is definitely targeting the single entry contest where each person is only allowed to put in one entry. Um, this just kind of helps you a little bit from getting over some of those people that enter the same lineup and they'll enter it in say 15, 20 times and create a train. Um, this helps us avoid those, those circumstances. So as you can see here, we've got single entry at the top. I've got some more single entry down here and these ones are multi and anything with an M over here in entries on DraftKings we're on right now, that's going to be your monster entry. If you hold your mouse over, that's going to tell you what the max entry is. So this is six. So if you are feeling comfortable, the six entry maxes are fine. It's just the bigger ones that we're going to be trying to avoid. Once you start getting down here a little bit more, the size of them are a lot smaller. Um, so these are going to be single entry all the way down here. Those are the contests we're looking for on a nightly basis. When we go over and we look at FanDuel under MLB, we can go two different places here. We can go 50-50s. We'll just go and we'll narrow this down again, $50 and less. So right now we're under MLB, we're under the 50-50 tab. These are generally 20 and 100 man contests. These are single entry contests. So this is what I'm looking for. So if we click on this one here, this is a $5-50-50. or a $5 /50 -50. Your prizes, 50 people out of 100 get paid, so half the field get paid, like I said, with the 50-50 contest. But then you pay your rake here. You're only going to get $9 back out of those 50 people. So that, those are some of the ones I like looking at. I like entering the 2 5 $10, 100 mans on FanDuel. And then you can also go over and you can click on multipliers here. That's going to give you cash games as well. So here's where we find our double ups. So we get into this $2 double up on this one it's a 60 max so we're going to be looking for more single ent entry but the top 875 get paid out of 2011 so not quite half the field gets paid but you get exactly double your money um, you can definitely look at those but like I said that's a 60 max contest I'm looking more for the single entry so when you get under these multipliers and you're looking for single entry just look over here right below the dollar amount uh, this one's two dollar multi entry um, scroll down a little bit, $25 single entry. So for the most part, we're looking for single entry contests that are going to help us out. I don't mind going in triple ups either, and it's all going to depend on the slate. If I feel very comfortable with my pitcher and, and my core bats, I'll definitely go ahead and jump in some triple triple ups as well. can help you on a nightly basis, just increase that bankroll a little bit more. A little bit more risk, of course, because you start going in there um, not have you know the half the field isn't getting paid out of this contest here 13 people four people get paid triple their money back so just keep that in mind um, when, when entering we're definitely looking for those single entries so those are some of the cash game contests that we're going to be looking to head to heads are in here once you start narrowing it down you can see how many um, this guy the heaters right now has 20 lineups he's got set up the exact same lineup 20 times so he's looking for 20 different people to go against in head to head so that's just kind of what you're looking at here and then it shows the rating. You get to know some of these names in here and which ones to avoid, which ones are sharps, which ones are building strong lineups every night. So it's always good when the night's over, not just count it as a win or a loss. Go back and analyze. Look at who you played, um, even in your 50-50 contest. Go back and look at your history and start breaking down some of those lineups. If you lost, it's even more important to go ahead that night and see if your process was good. Did I pick the right pitchers? What was the winning lineups using? Why was this player... 70% um, owned, why didn't I have them? Why didn't I choose them? What was my gut feeling on that? Going ahead and doing that, and that's going to be coming up in this video series as well, is breaking down some winning lineups as well as some losing lineups. Um, so stay tuned for that. But this video, we're going to go ahead and we're just going to keep talking about cash games and GPPs. So now we've talked about cash games on both sites and which to look at. So now from a strategy standpoint, what are we looking for in cash games, being that we don't need as much upside as your GPP contest to get paid? So we're going to go ahead and look at the sheet. For my pitchers, I'm looking for a couple things. Strikeouts are key. So one of the main things I'm looking at, I'm going to go over to the pitcher tab here. This is Thursday, May 2nd's sheet for today. Um, so first of all, I was looking at Jose Barrios as one of my top picks this morning um, for that day slate. It's kind of a weird slate it was today. Uh, but generally what I'm looking for when I open up this pitcher tab, that's the first thing I'm going to do is roster my pitcher. Um, and for the most part in cash games, I will pay up for the best pitcher, provided it's a pretty good matchup. So the matchup may have not been great for Jose Barrios playing Houston today, but like I talked about in chat a little bit, is I like he's way better at home, so his home splits are good. 25, as we know, 25% is about average, uh, 20 to 25% is about average for your K rate. He's at 26 and a half. 
12 and 12% swing in strike rate. So he's got that K upside. We need strikeouts to be able um, to get ahead of the field. That's going to create a nice floor for us as well. He doesn't allow a bunch of hard contact. Um, he's averaging about 85 mile an hour exit velocity in there. He doesn't walk a lot of people, so he's not getting in trouble there. Um, and the, one of the reasons I like looking at that walk rate is if you get a guy, let's go look at Charlie Morton, for example, 12% walk rate. He's walking more batters. He's, his pitch count's going to go up a lot quicker. And especially on FanDuel, his chances of going out there and getting a quality start are going to be greatly reduced if they start walking people and driving that pitch count up before the sixth inning um, start giving up runs. So looking, you know, if I'm deciding between one player or another, that's one thing I'm going to look at, especially from cash game perspective, is um, the walk rate. Because I want guys that keep their pitch count down that can go deep into the games, which is very rare in today's game with the uh, with the way the um, a lot of teams' bullpens are going these days. They've got a lot of guys that are going in there, just a bunch of specialists that are going one, two innings. So the starters are going a lot shorter into games. So if you can find those starters that are going six, seven innings on a daily basis versus some that are going five, six, you're increasing your floor substantially. And walk rate is one of the things that I'm looking at. When you get into the hitters, and we'll just jump into, let's say, okay, the second base tab on the sheet. What I'm looking for generally, and now we've got a fairly small sample size at the start of the season. We're now into May, but the sample size is still fairly small. But a couple things I'm looking at right off the bat is I'm going and looking at the 2019 overall stats. And before we start looking at average, um, I, to be honest, I don't really look at average too much anyway, unless I'm comparing it to expected stats and stuff like that. I want a guy with a high on base percentage. Obviously, players are going to get on base more than other players are going to have more chances to steal bases. They're going to have more chances to score runs. Um, so those are players I'm looking for for high floor. So you start comparing some of these players. Of course, the most expensive players are obviously going to have the best stats. Sometimes you can find, um, you know, diamonds in the rough, would you call it, or cheap value plays who are getting on base. So second base isn't really an indicator, but that's just one thing I'm looking at for sure. Um, also looking at WOBA, which is your weighted on base percentage. We talked about that a little bit. So not only getting on base, but how, not just how are they getting on base, but are they getting doubles, triples, home runs? So we want guys with a high WOBA. And then I'll compare that to their ex WOBA as well. A couple of examples here. Uh, Brandon Lau and Ozzy Albies have a great start. It's 370 and 381 WOBAs here. Their ex wobas are a little bit lower, not concerning to the point where we're going to see a ton of regression, but they definitely are. Start looking at a guy like Whit Merrifield. He's at 348 WOBA. His ex wobA is higher than his WOBA. I like to see that as well when breaking down players, um, knowing that he's going to get even, even better, um, it looks like, and his ex slugging percentage higher than his slugging percentage. So that's good there as well. And this is what I'll use to really start breaking it down. After I look at those stats and find a guy with a projected high floor because they're getting on base quite a bit. I want to look at batting order. I've got that in the sheet here now. As I enter lineups in the lineups page here, it automatically on each individual player tab is going to populate their batting order here. Um, so when deciding between players. So obviously here catcher that can be big as you can see a catcher go up the lineup that's a cheap price. The higher the batter hits in the order, obviously they're going to be projected for more at-bats per game than players that are down in the lineup. Um, and, of course, the more bats you have, the more opportunities you got to score fantasy points. Um, so that's definitely what we're looking at is high in the batting order. So when I'm stacking, and that's another thing we'll talk about here, um, I'll talk about stacking for cash games right now, is I'm just going to use the lineups page here a little bit. And let's just say we're looking at targeting San Diego against Mike Fulton Ninowitz. <laughs> uh, that name is a difficult one. Anyways, back, we're looking at San Diego's lineup. It is in, now this tab here is just a projected lineup, so I'm going to clear that away. But we're looking at their lineup here. If this was a team that I was looking at, I was really wanting to target, what I'm going to do for cash games when I'm stacking is I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket because... We've seen it many times, especially in cash games where 50% of the field gets paid, is you can have one, two, and sometimes even three zeros in your lineup and still cash if your core players and your pitchers really do well. Um, so what I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket and stack one team with four or five players. What I like to do is two or three player stacks depending on the slate. On a large slate, like say a Friday slate where they got the full 15 games, I'll usually try and get like three two-man stacks in there, and I'll look towards the top of the lineup for cash games. So for instance, I would go uh, Kinsler, 
and Reyes at the top of the order. Especially Reyes, um, his, his ex wall was up there, his wall was up there getting on base. But just for example, I'm going to use the top of the lineup. I would go Kinsler and Reyes from San Diego. Another team say I wanted to go Tampa Bay. Diaz and Pham at the top of the lineup. I'll generally concentrate my cash game stacks on two players from the top four of the lineup. They don't necessarily have to be back to back. You may want to go, say, Kinsler and Machado or Reyes and Machado or Hosmer and Machado, whatever way it works out. But I'll generally look for three or four teams that are top projected on any given slate, and then I'll try and narrow it down to two to three players on each of those teams. And then I'll just kind of look at the prices from there and see which two and three-man stacks I can fit into my cash game lineups based on on-base percentage. Uh, Woba, X Woba, those things that we just talked about. So that's kind of the stacking strategy that I use for cash games and how I'll go build in my lineup. So we're just going to jump in here. We'll have a look. This is a two game slate, so we're just going to actually ignore that. Um, we'll look at this more in an advanced lineup construction mode once we get deeper into the, the video series. So that's kind of how I'm going to go about cash games. Now let's take a look at GPPs. So GPP, if you're new to DFS, just stands for Guaranteed Prize Pool, and it's any contest where there's a predetermined prize pool in there. And in any of these GPPs slash tournaments, if you want to call them tournaments, you're generally, with cash games like we talked about, you're generally paying off 45 to 50 percent of the field in any whether it's a 50 50 or a double up in GPPs you're gen in these contests you're only paying out 15 to 25 percent of the entrance in the field depending on the site depending on the contest the size of the contest and that sort of thing but for the most part it's 15 to 25 percent so this makes it harder to not only just min cash but it makes it harder to you know make a lot of money and win a GPP because you need a ton more upside. Let's go ahead and explain this a little bit further. So we're just going to go in, we're going to look at tournaments. So we're now on MLB, we're on today's slate, we're now looking at tournaments. Um, let's look at this 100k relay throw, 25k to first for tonight. $15 entry fee, first pays 25000 This is a pretty um, pretty balanced payout here, twenty-five thousand. It's not like the Millie Maker where it's a you know a million for first and all the way down to a hundred thousand for second or one hundred fifty thousand. It's a lot more balanced here when it comes to the payouts. Now, seventeen hundred and tenth place gets you a min cash in this tournament, twenty-three dollars, which isn't even double your money to get there. What that is, seventeen hundred and ten people. All we're going to do is divide seventeen hundred and ten, which is where you need to get divided by the entrance, which is seventy-eight hundred and forty-three. And what we get when we do that is 22%. So you need to t make it into the top 22% of all the entrants in this contest to just make $23 on your $15 entry. You want to start making a three times return, which you're looking at $45. So somewhere in that 230th place range, 230 divided by 7,843, you need to be in the top 3% of all the people in that contest just to make a three times return. Okay, you want to make a 10 times return. Looking at $150 here. You want to make $150? You need to finish 31st in this contest. 31 people divided by 7,843. You're down below 1% of all the people in this contest just to make a 10 times return. We haven't even talked about winning yet. Um, we, we're only in the 10 times return pocket. So this is why we say concentrate on cash games to build your bankroll, which then again help you climb up the entry fees that you can go in, you know, the level that you're playing at, and it also helps you pay for your GPP entries. Um, you're not going to win GPPs nearly as often as you're going to win cash games. So get your basis of your whole contest selection, contest entry on a nightly basis in 70 to 80 percent of your cash games. And if you're successful at that four to five times a week, you're going to consistently build that bankroll. Um, you're not going to have to deposit anymore. Um, you're going to be doing more withdrawals than deposits. So that's kind of what we're teaching. With some of these other GPPs, some of the strategies for GPPs, let's go over and just look at FanDuel real quick and contest selection if you're looking for GPP formats. MLB, um, we're going to go over to tournaments here. That's, that's the number one thing we're looking at. Some of these in multipliers, and we talked about this with cash games actually, I talked about these max entries, but I also talked about triple ups. 
Triple ups, I don't, I still consider cash games. When you start getting into the quintuple ups, um, five times your money. So you jump into this $25 contest, you finish in the top six out of 34, you get five times your money. Those I start looking more as GPP, just because it pays less of the field. So tournaments are the big one. If you want to find single entry tournaments, the biggest thing you can do is, especially on FanDuel, it's easy to find over here, is go down and you can actually select single entry. You're only going to be shown single entry contests. Or if you've got all selected, you can definitely, like I said before, look down this right hand column right below the money. You're going to see multi entry. Um, you're going to see single entry. You're going to see all that information there. On DraftKings, once you get into this tournament tab, you, there is no advanced filter that allows you to select single entry, but you can see that clearly underneath this entries column. Anything with an M is a multi entry, and like I said, you can scroll your mouse over it. It's going to show you what the max is. So for this relay throw that we were looking at, 25K to first, it's 150 entry max. You're putting yourself at a great disadvantage if you're entering contests like this where there's 150 max entries and you're only entering one or you know a couple lineups. You're, it's just a dart throw. Um, it's like a lottery ticket, some people say. If you're trying to be successful at DFS, if you're just doing it for fun, that's great. That's fine. Go ahead and do that. If you're trying to be successful over the long term, you're, you're putting yourself at a great disadvantage because you're playing against people, probably hundreds of people. Um, we're looking at the entrance here. Almost 8,000 entries in this contest. I bet you at least 50 people are at least 50 are putting in that 150 entry max. They're building player pools. They're using uh, software, optimizer software, to go ahead and pretty much get their core, or you know, sometimes they'll go ahead and build five, six. I talk about building two or three cores in GPPs and go ahead and doing that. Uh, this is something I'm going to discuss. They're building like 10 cores and going ahead and putting it all in so they have the best chance to take down that tournament. If you're only putting in one or two lineups, the chances of that being a duplicate lineup with 100 other people is very great. So this is why we say concentrate on single entry contests. So you can find these either labeled here or like I said, in this entries column, find anything that doesn't have an M, that's going to be your single entry. It is crucial that you target those if you're only playing a couple lineups a night. If you're playing max entry, that's great. And DraftKings does a great job of getting these 20 entry max. And I will, when I start playing multi-entry, these are the contests that I like going in. So 20 entry max, $4, that's 80 bucks. You build 20. Um, when I go ahead and build those 20 lineups um, on any given night on a regular slate, I'm usually going to get a narrow my player field down. And what I'm going to do is look for stacks. Now I'm going to get into stacks here in a second, but I'll I'll get three or four pitchers and I'll put them together on DraftKings. On FanDuel, we're only looking at one pitcher. But I'll say I'll put two pitchers together. Let's just jump right into this contest and just have a look here. Taking a bit to load. Um, okay, so this is a bit smaller slate, so keep this in mind. But I will go two pitchers, and then I'll find a stack. So let's just say we want to stack Toronto. And they're going to be, say, one, two, three, and four hitters just want to get four players. So going with the four player stack. I will take that same core of my two favorite pitchers as well as my my stack, the team that I'm stacking, and I will put this, I will swap in the different catcher and the three different outfielders or whatever positions are using. Um, I'm not necessarily going to use these four players. Obviously, Bo Bichette isn't in the majors yet, but this is just for an example. Um, I'll fill in around and then I'll enter this contest again, but I'll use four different players in these four open spots. And then in some of them, you know, I may keep one outfielder that I really like, but generally I'm going to do four-player stack and then another four-player stack if I can fit it. So I'll find another team where I can get three outfielders and a catcher from or whatever positions I have open. And then I will take that so I'll have my main core of pitchers, my main stack, and I'll have that mixed with another stack, and then I'll go and build that lineup again, and I'll flip the other stack that I put it with it. And then after I'm done that, I'll go ahead and I'll swap my pitchers, but I'll keep my stack two other pitchers with that same different team and then I'll do that again and then I'll go and switch my pitchers again and then I'll go back to my main core pitchers here and then my main core stack will be gone so then I'll go to say Boston and I'll put four Boston players in and I'll build the same lineups. And it all depends on how many lineups you're building to the strategy that you're using but you're best to build a core and then build that core in about 40-50 percent of your lineups. So out of 10 lineups I'm maybe not 10, say 40%, so say about 8. 8 of my lineups, I'm going to have the same two core pitchers with 
say out of those eight, I'm going to have four or five with that main Toronto stack, and then I'm going to switch in the other stacks. So that when your core does go off, you're going to have a better chance of hitting that top spot of or hitting the nuts, you know, using a poker term. Um, so that's how I go about that. We're going to get into some more advanced lineup construction for GPPs in a later video. But that's generally how I go about doing it. It's kind of hard to show you with just two games on the slate. But that's how I go about building my GPP stacks. And then for strategy, we'll go back to the cheat sheet here for a second. For pitchers, I'm definitely looking at that K upside. But I'm looking a lot more at the matchup for, on any given day. So on my cheat sheet, when you're looking at pitchers, Let's just go ahead and look at, say, Noah Syndergaard, for instance. So the over-under is 7. That's good. They're a favorite. That's good. Um, the park factor is good, so he's in a good pitcher environment. The weather's good. Um, the ERA is high. It's good to see that. The XFIP is three runs lower, and actually this game just completed. Syndergaard had a great game. Um, so the, the positive regression that appeared to be coming definitely did come today. He's got a pretty good K rate. That's definitely going to go up. I believe his career average is around 28 to 30%. He's got the swing and strike rate, so the upside is there. He's facing a team, and this is opponent versus daily split, and I'll go back and explain this. If you want to look at the opponent, which is Cincinnati today, this is all opponent data in these columns. So this is Cincinnati versus lefties. This is Cincinnati versus righties. This is Cincinnati the last 7, 14 days, and on the season. So I start breaking that down, and then what I do is determine, okay, Syndergaard is right-handed. He's facing Cincinnati today, so how does Cincinnati do against Wright? So you don't have to come over here and you don't got to break down the splits. I've actually got it sorted out so that it knows that Syndergaard is right-handed. And this is each pitcher's opponent's splits that day. So for instance, Matt Strom, it's going to be pulling Atlanta's stats versus lefties. All these other pitchers, it's going to be pulling their opponent's stats versus righties. So that's kind of what it's looking at. It's looking at what hand the pitcher is and the split for that day just to make it a little bit easier so you can compare one pitcher to another. So as you can see, Syndergaard really stands out in his opponent because Cincinnati has really struggled against righties. Go over and confirm that. Sure enough, the 279 Wobo versus righties, 68 WRC plus and a 157 ISO versus lefties, they got a 300 plus Woba, 88 WRC plus, which also isn't great, but it's a lot better than against righties. So the matchup is there. So there is a lot of upside. I want a team that strikes out a lot as well. And you look at overall this season, they're striking out almost 25% of the time. So that's where the upside for the pitcher comes is even more strikeouts. And from an, own from an ownership standpoint, we're always going to have pitchers um, like Cindergard, who's going to be high on a slate like this. He's the most talented pitcher, obviously. Jose Barrios as well. His matchup wasn't as high. So on any given slate, Noah Cindergard is going to be higher owned than Barrios just because of that matchup that we're looking at. So if you wanted to hedge in some tournaments, or not sorry, not hedge, but if you wanted to pivot in GPPs against some of that, you know, in a small slate like today's, Cindergard being very owned, 40, 50 percent owned, 60 percent owned in GPPs you could always pivot away from a guy in the same price range who maybe has a worse matchup like Jose Barrios, which I did like today for a couple reasons, because Houston, all the splits were against them. They're worse on the road. They're worse against right-handed pitching. Barrios is better at home versus the road. So everything kind of lined up there. He was going to be a little bit lower on. He made an excellent GPP pivot today off of the higher on Syndergaard. Turns out they both did fairly well. Syndergaard was the better pitcher overall today, but that's some things that you can look at in GPPs on how to pivot away um, from some of the chalk plays and make your lineup a little bit more unique. Another thing I will do in GPPs, and we talked about stacking in cash games, how I'll, I'll tend to go towards the top of the order. That's something that we can definitely go against in GPPs. So let's just say, for instance, San Diego was the top projected team scoring-wise today um, say they're you know I forget what their overall projection was I think it was around you know four and a half runs or something like that even if it was even if it wasn't just for example here anyways so for cash games I said I would concentrate on the top four hitters now if they're the the highest projected team they're going to be high owned obviously in GPPs as well most people are going to concentrate on the top four hitters it makes sense those are your best hitters in the lineup they're going to see the most played appearances um, for that, they're going to be the highest owned. Something you can do in GPPs, and this may be a little bit more advanced if you're not doing multi-entries, is doing a bottom of the lineup. So instead of going one to four, some things that you can do is pivot and go three to six hitters, or 
four to seven. Or sometimes what some people will do now, especially with American League teams where there's no pitchers, is go eight, nine, one, two. This is going to give you exposure to those high scoring teams, but it's going to give you some of the lower owned players in that lineup just because they're in different spots of the lineup. Generally, your, like I said, your highest owned players are going to be your top four, and generally your highest owned stack is going to be the leadoff hitter, number two, three, and four hitter in a lineup. So going against that and just going with a with a little bit different lineup construction can help you have a lower owned lineup um, as while still targeting um, those high projected owned team or those high projected scoring teams on any given slate. So that's just a little bit of insight into some GPP strategy. Like I said, we're going to get into some more advanced GPP strategy lineup construction in a later video. But that's just a little bit of insight on some things I look at when building GPP lineups. All right, we talked about cash games. We talked about GPPs. We talked about contest selection and how to find the best contests on FanDuel and DraftKings, how to target those single entries, how to, you know, a look into uh, some advanced GPP lineup construction as well. If you've got any questions, definitely hit me up in the comments below. Hit me up in the Roto Pros members chat room or on Twitter at Jaeger underscore bombs nine. With that, Please like and subscribe to the video. A lot more coming down the line. If you set your notifications, you'll get an email whenever I come out with a new video or we go live. Thanks for watching, and let's go get some green screens. Good luck, everyone.